Good evening, everybody. Um, so my name is James. Uh, I am the marketing manager for the MBA program at China Europe International Business School here in Shanghai. Uh, that is my, my day job. And this evening, uh, we are doing bringing you a webinar that's slightly different from the regular admissions webinar that we're that we're doing. And this is really a response to the trend that has seen many uh, young expats uh, leave China and leave Shanghai. Um, and really, we want to do something for this uh, this this target audience. Okay. I think the figures that we last saw said that maybe half of the expat population of Shanghai has already left. And there are big question marks. If it's the right time to leave, when is the right time? What are the opportunities abroad? How you should begin your job search from China? What can you do here? Uh, what do you have to wait till you're doing until uh, uh, until until uh, you're actually in the uh, in your your target country so really with that we've put together this webinar and we've uh, pulled in some of our great resources which is our alumni so i have with me this evening uh, three alumni that graduated from the mba program here at sieves in in shanghai now, before we get into the, the body of the discussion, I'm well aware that, that maybe people in the audience are already familiar with our school. Maybe for some of them, MBA and CIBS, it's, uh, it's quite new. So I just want to explain why we as a school have the, the personnel uh, and the experience to answer this quite uh, big question or at least uh, engage and discuss it with you this evening. So first of all, as a school, uh, we were established in 1994. Uh, we're a high level joint venture between the Chinese government and the European Commission and have five campuses across the world, three in China, our European uh, campus in Zurich and our campus in, in Africa, in, uh, in Accra, in Ghana. Um, amongst the, the, we obviously we have three uh, alumni joining us this evening, but in total we have 25,000 alumni spread across the, across the world and 17 overseas chapters, right, um, in, in Europe and, uh, and North America and Asia, um, that when our alumni leave China to go and work, uh, they form a close connection with this, with this community. Uh, if you've been to our campus and uh, experienced any of our, our lectures or classes, you'll know that uh, we are China Europe International Business School for a reason. The international part is extremely important to us. Uh, so these are just examples of the faculty that uh, teach with us uh, in, in, in Shanghai, uh, two thirds of which uh, are internationals, one third are, are Chinese. Uh, so 72 full time professors. Um, and all or most of them have uh, received their PhDs from overseas uh, institutions. Now, the MBA program that I mentioned is one of the many degree programs that we have at the school. It's a full time English program that can be completed in either 12 or 16 months. Uh, we also are uh, globally accredited and are very highly ranked amongst the, uh, the, the main publications in the world. So the Financial Times, Forbes and Bloomberg Business Week rank us as an MBA program at a business school as number one in Asia. Okay. Um, if you're wondering about the student body that we have on the MBA program, uh, then we tend to take in about 150 students. Uh, typically, they have around six years work experience. And this year, we actually hit uh, um, uh, gender uh, parity by 50% female, 50% male that's on the, on the course. Uh, some are from business background, but it's a very diverse intake of, of students. But they're doing a Master of Business Administration because they're looking to excel their career in the, in the business world. In addition to the academics that we have at the school, we also have a career development center where I have 10 colleagues that work on a one-on-one -on -one basis with our, our students um, to introduce opportunities and to help them to hone their profile and application and CV and covering letter to apply for the, the job and career they're looking to, to pivot to after graduating from the, the MBA program. Uh, if it is that you're interested after this session uh, in, uh, in joining us as a, as a student, uh, then now is a great time to do that. Um, we have a very generous scholarship uh, pool. Uh, typically for students, uh, one third of them receive a, a scholarship up to 40, 50% of tuition. Uh, however, this year we have something quite special uh, called the Beyond Borders Camp uh, for internationals that are based in China. If they're looking to uh, come to our campus and really experience uh, what we're all about, experience the alumni network, experience the curriculum, uh, the current students, and to see if an MBA is the right fit for you and uh, our school is the right school to provide that. So I'll explain a little bit about this uh, towards the end of the, of the presentation.
now I would like to go over to the main body of our um, of our presentation, where I'm inviting three of our uh, alumni to to share their stories and experience with us. So the first half of this session, uh, I will be the moderator of the, the panel. I have some questions prepared, and then we'll move into uh, a free free Q and A. So if you have any questions, uh, please if you can put them in the the Q and A box, and then uh, after the moderated session, we will get to to those questions. Okay, so maybe let's kick off with the, the first question. And Sashant, uh, you're first on the on the list on my my PPT. Uh, if you can un unmute yourself and open your your camera. And what I would like to, to ask you, maybe just for a general introduction. So tell us what you're doing now. Um, you know, tell us if it is is China uh, related, and let us know if you know how you knew it was the right time for you to leave China. Um, sure, thanks for that, James. Um, unfortunately, due to some technical issue, I don't think I can start my video. It doesn't allow me to do that. And I think uh, maybe that's something that you can check while I maybe introduce myself. Sure. Yeah, yeah I will work on that. If you carry on, I will work on uh, trying to get you uh, your, your, your face on screen. <laughs> Great. So uh, good evening to everyone. So my name is Sushan Gupta. I recently uh, moved out of China last year in October. So currently I'm working with an organization called uh, Boringer Ingelheim. It's a German pharmaceutical company. And uh, currently in my global role, I'm working as a talent and a leadership development manager. Whereas in China, I was working at the same organization. Uh, I was with them in China for a little over four years um, and I was work, I was in the function after uh, everything to do with talent, leadership and performance uh, within the HR team. I think the reason why I decided to leave China was not a sudden decision. So it was not so much to um, do with the fact that, you know, other expats are leaving or anything related to COVID, but more for the fact that, you know, I had already worked in China for about, um, a little over five years, so since our graduation in 2016. And I had been sort of planning my career in the sense to gain the experience that I wanted in China after the MBA, which I did. And that seemed at the right time to switch from a, a region specific role, which my role was in China, to a global role. So that is when the discussions within my organization itself started that, you know, it's, it's time for, for a switch. And that is uh, by the end of last year, then we decided that I moved to a headquarters here in Germany. And that's how the, the move came about. Thank you, Shashant. Just uh, just quickly, are you still um, are you still kind of uh, in, involved in, in China? Or as you say, now you have a much bigger remit in a global role. Uh, is there, you know, do you have opportunities to kind of use that that wealth of China experience on, on a on a day-to-day -day basis or a project basis? Absolutely. And that was one of the reasons why. I got the opportunity in the headquarters is because of the experience in China, because China being one of the biggest markets that we have uh, within the industry as well as the organization, it's always essential to understand that, you know, if you roll out something new from an HR perspective or a talent perspective, how does that actually fare in one of the biggest markets that we have? So having that experience, that understanding firsthand was crucial. And now for all our global projects that we do, China tends to be a pilot market. So having that connection, that relation with the team there, but also having that understanding of the market is very helpful. So I would say that, yes, I mean, of course, the projects are global, but China still continues to play a, a big part in that. Perfect. Thank you, Sushant, and, and welcome. Uh, Neil, over to, over to you. Uh, thank you, and hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm Neil, um, originally from the UK. Um, I started my career in London as a hedge fund trader, uh, which I did for two years. Then in early 2013, I moved to Shanghai um, because I thought that China would be our generation's big opportunity. Um, I was mostly working in the investment management industry, um, particularly in corporate strategy. And then after six and a half years of working in China and having become a fluent Mandarin speaker, um, I started my MBA at C in August 2019, actually in the same class as Margarita. Um, I was a finance club president. I was a student ambassador and won the student leader award. Um, and then after eight years in Shanghai, I left in May 2021 and moved back to London, where I'm now a vice president at JP Morgan, uh, working in the payments business. Um, it's not China focused, uh, but knowing about the Chinese market is useful. And you know, as I'll explain in a moment, this is exactly the type of China exposure I wanted after the MBA. Um, as for why I left, I suppose there's two reasons. Um, first, I don't see a long-term future in the Chinese job market anymore for foreign nationals. 
Um, I think you know when I arrived in 2013, Chinese firms were keen to expand overseas, and foreign firms were eager to enter into the Chinese market. So there was real demand for foreign talent that actually could help to bridge that divide. Um, and to be honest, that's probably why a lot of us originally moved to China in the first place. Um, however, in the past five years, you know, the Chinese economy has turned very much inwards on itself, and you know, the West is becoming a bit more wary of China. So I think nowadays, there's just no real demand for foreign nationals that turns in China, um, because they're just solely focused on the domestic market. And then the second reason is that I didn't want to become a China expert, um, because I think it limits your long-term job opportunities. You know, you'll find it difficult to find a role with a global or even a regional focus, uh, because firms will just think that it's an inefficient use of your talents and your background. And then if you do try to sell yourself as, to companies as a China expert, let's be honest, it's very hard to justify why you should get the job over a Chinese national. Um, so, you know, before it was too late, I wanted to transition to become someone with a strong global knowledge of a particular industry, including China, but not just limited to China. Thank you, Neil. That's uh, that, that that's great. And uh, Margarita, uh, finally over to over to you. Welcome. Thank you, James. Uh, hello, everyone. So this is Margarita. Um, graduated from uh, uh, CIPS MBA 2021. So the same class as Neil as well. Um, actually, I started my career in China. Um, I started with a position uh, as a purchasing coordinator in the south of China. And then I moved to Beijing and worked for a ceramic tiles company, Italian ceramic tiles company for about four years. And after that, I decided that I wanted to somehow pivot my career. This is why I decided to start an MBA in China and SIPS was uh, the first option uh, that I, um, I went for. So, um, when I decided to go back to China, that was not intentional. In my case, it was in the midst of the COVID. So uh, basically it was uh, right before the Chinese New Year 2020. So it was January and uh, I purchased my flight ticket. It was a return ticket back to Italy and then back again to China. When I closed the door of my apartment, I would never imagine that I would never <laughs> go back. To, uh, to Shanghai. So uh, basically I, I, I was stuck in, in Italy. I couldn't go back to China anymore. And um, I finished my MBA online because of course then the school uh, tried to uh, cope with all the challenges uh, coming with the COVID. And uh, we started uh, online classes. Uh, then uh, they became like hybrid classes with those uh, uh, schoolmates that uh, were still in China mainland and other schoolmates like me that uh, were uh, outside of, uh, of China's borders. So uh, I completed my MBA online, let's say, graduated in April 2021. Um, it took a while for me to uh, find a new position in Italy because at the very beginning, I didn't want to accept the fact that uh, I would not be able to find a job in China. But because of the circumstances, it would be very, very difficult for me being outside of China to find a position in China and fly back to China. So finally, I resumed, uh, let's say, uh, looking for a job in my own country and trying to uh, make the most of uh, what my new uh, CV would tell uh, the job uh, the job um, uh, job searchers, uh, let's say. So um, I tried to focus on my China experience, uh, the way that the fact that I can speak Mandarin as well. And I tried to uh, stick to the industry that I belong to. Uh, although, uh, let's say in my MBA, one of my wish was uh, uh, to uh, switch uh, the industry I belong to, because I belong to, let's say, the construction industry. Uh, I was very, very interested in the food and beverage industry, but it was very difficult to find uh, uh, a job in the Italian market. Uh, in an industry in which I did not have much experience. So I stuck, let's say, to the uh, construction industry. I found first a permanent position um, in uh, uh, Milan area uh, that was uh, um, uh, elevators company. But after a few months, I was basically contacted again by my former employer, the employer of the company I used to work for before the MBA. And he gave me a much better, uh, let's say, offer, uh, which I decided to accept because the position is uh, much higher with bigger responsibility. And uh, now I'm, uh, yes, I'm working as um, 
uh, sales manager for the Far East, uh, uh, let's say, countries uh, um, that our company is, uh, is working uh, with we produce with manufacture uh, Italian made ceramic tiles and we export into different countries, including China, including uh, a lot of different countries in the Far East. So not just China, but also other countries are involved and definitely my China experience fits in. Great, thank you. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, Neil, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to you for the, for, for the second of my questions to, to start with. Um, so maybe you can kind of talk us through how your when you were kind of interviewing or when you're in the process with JV Morgan, you know, how was this this China experience uh, perceived, you know, by recruiters or, or line managers that you were interviewing? Uh, as you mentioned in your introduction, you know, it's you already have that kind of fi finance skills, right? So you're trading on that in the in the interview and and to, to get the job, no, no doubt. But, um, you know, it must obviously come up, even though, as you say, you're keen not to kind of pigeonhole yourself as a, as a China expert. You know, was it was it met with kind of intrigue or general kind of indifference and, you know, anything that, you know, people should know if they're kind of starting that that process? Yeah, sure. I mean, it was, I mean, like I say, it, it was impossible to avoid it. You know, the first question in an interview was always just, uh, tell me about yourself. And well, most of my adult life has been spent in China, so I couldn't really avoid it. But yeah, it was certainly, it was certainly taken with a lot of intrigue. I mean, uh, during my interview process, I interviewed with some really senior management. Look, they all said that, you know, my background is very interesting and very unique. Um, and again, you know, I think a lot of people on this, on this webinar will have a, a reasonably similar background as well. And, you know, even after getting the job, you know, when I'm doing intro calls or intro coffee chats with people within the company, you know, the China experience is always something that they want to talk about because it's different. You know, I suppose as well, in finance, most people seem to have worked at a few large banks and ended up at the most recent one. So, for example, they've been to City and then HSBC and then ended up at JP Morgan or some variation of that. So if you have a background that's different to that, then it stands out in a positive way. And then just in terms of team dynamics, companies don't want a team that's made up of clones where everyone has the same background, the same experience, and the same way of viewing the world. So, you know, this is something that you, know, you can try to reiterate in the interview process because you know, companies value this, this thought diversity. Yeah, I really, I really like that, Neil. Thanks. A lot, a lot of points, good points, and also the the rest of the panel nodding, nodding away furiously. Uh, Sushant, um, do, I mean, do you do you resonate with that? I imagine as well, you're kind of in a kind of learning and development role. You're maybe somewhat in, in, involved in kind of the, the talent development side. So, you know, from your perspective, and also kind of working for, with people at BI, um, you know, how how is it kind of perceived within the, the the company? And any advice for the for the for the attendees today? Yeah, no, I think I echo what Neil said that, you know, the China experience is still viewed as something very interesting and different because not a lot of people have it. Um, so even, you know, it's, it's very similar for me that most of my coffee chat lunches all revolve around the fact that, you know, I worked in China for half of my career. So that is always very interesting to most of the organization to understand what it was like and also how I can, you know, leverage that. The other thing which is quite helpful in um, looking for jobs externally, so even when I was in China, I was being approached by organizations outside of BR to move to either Germany or to move to other countries in Europe. And they're very interested to see what you can come back with as an understanding of that market because they actually want to enter that market or expand there. And this, I think, may vary from function to function, role to role, because maybe working in HR and talent that has advantage for organizations trying to expand. Uh, so that was always, you know, the starting point of the discussion that if we are looking to, uh, with external recruiters, that if we are looking to, you know, launch in China or expand some of our operations, what do you think we should be doing uh, differently or how can we potentially, you know, attract better people to the organization? Um, the one point I just wanted to sort of circle back to what Neil mentioned earlier, and which is slightly different from your question, James, is the fact that um, I agree to an extent that yes, um, China is you know, closing in certain ways to jobs that are relevant for foreigners, but in a lot of the areas, it's actually increasing its demands for foreigners. So it really depends on which part of the industry or what sort of roles you're looking into. So I would say 10 years ago, maybe you know, the focus was more on general roles where the expertise lacked, and now that has been built up by local Chinese. But when we are recruiting people for biotech or for biopharma or for you know, any tech related, uh, we are still looking heavily outside China because that talent doesn't exist. So those expertise don't exist, even when it comes to R&D. 
So there's still a lot of demand in China for foreign talent. However, it's becoming more and more specialized and you know, focused on certain aspects of the industry. Yeah, that's uh, that's great. Thank you, thank you for that. And and Margarita, um, your experience, uh, if you wouldn't mind. Yes. Well, um, again, it took a while for me to understand the request of the local market because uh, I had been absent from Italy for a while. I, my my time in in China had been pretty long, more than six years. So. Uh, it took me a while to understand the real request of, uh, of employers, let's say, but then uh, I realized that I had to focus on those that were looking for a China expert, not just a Chinese translator, because there are so many people that study Chinese and are able to translate Chinese. So uh, companies looking for a Chinese speaking person are basically looking for someone that graduated in the language and uh, and help them probably deal with some uh, some suppliers or customers. But in my case, uh, I was successful in those uh, uh, companies that were actually looking for a person that had this kind of experience, that had this kind of knowledge of how things uh, go in China, how to deal with both Chinese suppliers and Chinese customers. So in my previous job experience in Milan, uh, I was covering a role in the purchasing department. So my job there was actually to try to uh, harmonize uh, the relationship with the Chinese supplier, which was uh, quite uh, confused <laughs> somehow. So uh, it was a matter of negotiating uh, the best price, the best timing, uh, and that was that was quite interesting. I, I managed to uh, let's say transfer some of my knowledge in this sense and uh, try to smooth out the relationship and try to uh, smooth out as well communication. And now I'm doing the same thing, but the other way around, because now I am selling to uh, Chinese or other people in, uh, in Asia. The culture is a kind of a similar, let's say. So when I'm dealing with some uh, uh, maybe Korean or Japanese or, or uh, well, in Taiwan as well. Well, there is uh, some subtle, uh, let's say, knowledge that uh, you can use uh, in dealing with them. And sometimes this thing is not something that people know if they have not lived in China and uh, studied uh, maybe business in China. So uh, I'm definitely using uh, what I have, uh, uh, I have acquired in those years uh, and finally with SIBS uh, in my daily job. Great, thank you, thank you, Margarita. And uh, yeah, I'd like to get into the the job role of uh, harmonizing relationships. Uh, yeah, a little bit later. That's uh, <laughs> that definitely sounds like a like a, a challenge. Um, I, I've got a, a, just a, just a couple of a uh, couple of questions left. Um, this one it's kind of also from you know from, from my side. So um, maybe just to share with everybody before I. I started working for for Seeds Business School in the MBA department. Uh, I was um, I, head of a the China desk of a recruitment agency in in London, um, and we would have uh, we would place kind of people within uh, UK and in Europe that were looking for either Mandarin speakers or or, or let's, call them, let's call them China talent, you know, regardless of, uh, of of nationality. And this was one of the questions that we kind of get quite a lot from kind of people that were maybe in China but looking to kind of pivot back to the UK or pivot back from you know from from Europe and you know one of the one of the challenges was when we would receive uh, CVs you know some days we open up the inbox and we receive 200 CVs right and uh, something small like if the if their address was still in China you know at that stage unless they had a, an absolute knockout resume we didn't know how serious they were about kind of you know coming to to the UK so it might be that some of these you know these kind of talents get get overlooked which I think is you know, quite an important thing for maybe people joining this webinar this evening to, to kind of to, to think about as, as well, right? Is obviously the fine margins when it comes to, to landing job opportunities. Um, so my rambling way of getting to my, my question, and, and Margarita, maybe I, I start with you if, if that's okay. Um, so maybe you can kind of talk us through, you know, kind of landing kind of your, um, you know, I guess kind of the first job at the elevator company or the, the kind of the current job in, in ceramics. Um, you know, if I, I guess if you could kind of give advice to people that are starting their search from from China, you know, what would you have done if, as you say, if COVID hadn't 
hit and you know you could kind of leave china in your in your own time you know now looking back in retrospect what steps do you think you could have taken whilst you were kind of you know feet on the ground in china to to kind of get ready for that switch well linkedin 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 <laughs> you need to become a very uh that's of course my personal experience so my personal advice um in my in my in my case, I, I have to say, I, I studied how to exploit uh, LinkedIn resources. I started, uh, I had my LinkedIn account when I started uh, like my MBA at SIPS, but in SIPS, uh, we actually had some courses that would teach us how to properly use LinkedIn. And I, I started to build up my network. I think I had something like 300 um, uh, people in my network in LinkedIn. And during my MBA, I could go over 500. And this is something important because when people see that you have more than maybe 500 connections, that also makes you like stand out a little bit more than other people. So uh, then you need to polish it a little bit and trying to provide a, a faithful uh, description of who you are, what you do, and uh, try to keep it updated and try to post uh, uh, contents that uh, could be um, attractive for potential um, employers, maybe. So um, I would also say, uh, I would recommend to invest in a LinkedIn premium subscription because uh, you can use it uh, to filter the job offers. You can actually see the people that are looking at your, um, your profile. Sometimes it happens that, for example, you send out um, uh, a candidacy for a job position and you did not get an answer from the company because probably you have sent an email right but you will see that maybe in one or two days someone from that company has looked your profile on LinkedIn and so you know you say okay well I haven't received an answer but maybe someone has looked at my profile and if you have LinkedIn premium sometimes you are able to get in touch with this person so that's helpful. This is also how I could reach out to some uh, job employers and uh, have some conversation and get more information about that. For me, LinkedIn was really, really useful because, uh, you know, uh, if I was in China looking for a job in China, I would probably have received also the support from uh, our CDC, um, the career center that somehow helps you uh, through uh, priority channels. You have a lot of meetings with companies and everything. But when you're outside of China, you know, SIBS is not really uh, very present outside of China, not really in Europe. So you need to try to work it out to yourself. So uh, when I started to focus uh, exactly on the kind of industry and position that I was looking for that, so you need to be really clear with yourself, first of all. Because if you're just looking at random, it's very difficult that you're going to land a proper job, probably. And uh, you, so you first uh, try to clear up your mind on where to focus and uh, direct your research in this. You use the filters in order to uh, let this system automatically send you notifications about new job offers within the industry you're looking for, within the positions you're looking for. And uh, anytime you find something uh, that could be interested, you just apply for the job. So uh, yeah, that's the way I landed my job. Um, the elevator job in the second case, uh, well, the company contacted me, so I was very lucky. Could, could I just get, I see that you raised an interesting point, Margarita, about kind of, you know, posting kind of uh, content and using that as, I guess, as kind of phishing or, you know, a hook to kind of get interest in the companies you're interested in. You know, do you have a kind of a specific example of maybe something you wrote or, or reposted that then led to kind of, uh, you know, an opportunity for a conversation? or any, any kind of best practice in that area? I have never posted something related to the company, let's say I was looking for. I just posted something that would show that I, you know, I'm a person that once is curious about maybe some topics uh, and uh, um, I can show others uh, that apart from what you see from my LinkedIn profile, uh, I also have maybe other skills or interests. Mm. So, um, uh, as an example, I took uh, the Excel course, uh, advanced course, 
And of course, so when you finish uh, your uh, Excel course and you get your certificate, so of course you post it on LinkedIn so that people can see that you also have Excel skills. Sometimes it's written, sometimes it's not, but if you can post on your uh, award, uh, uh, your certificate of achievement, of course, so this is something useful. Then I remember uh, maybe sometimes I would probably post uh, some um, interesting articles uh, that were published uh, by SIPS. Or in other cases, uh, I would post uh, um, something about, uh, uh, I remember I, we, we did a project management, project management class and uh, we did do a research and a report uh, about some issues that we decided with uh, our professor at that time. And that thing was published. The professor asked us if, if we could publish it on uh, his own, let's say, blog. And so that also created some uh, some um, uh, activity in my own page. And I had a lot of people uh, uh, sort of uh, reading it and uh, and liking it and things like that. So um, should be something that describes you apart from what you see on uh, on LinkedIn itself. Mm. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. And uh, Sushant, maybe we'll come to you in, in terms of the, the, the same question. Sure. So I think uh, my experience is slightly different in this regard because I moved internally with my, uh, with my organization. So it was to an extent easier, uh, of course, you know, to find a job and have those discussions because I already knew everyone that I would be working with and to build those connections. However, during the course of uh, my tenure at BI in China, I, I was approached by recruiters. I also got, um, you know, some direct opportunities, and they were not so much as Margarita described from my perspective from LinkedIn personally for me, but they were more from the network within Shanghai itself. Because one thing that's great about Shanghai and you know doing the MBA from Seeds is that you actually build up a very international network, and all the expats that you have in your network are essentially also looking to leave at some point or have recently come into China. So they also have their own network in terms of, you know, finding opportunities. And that's, that was one of the great things about, you know, having that sort of um, access through your friends and through, you know, other people that you meet in Shanghai. So the three or four opportunities that I got offered for, and not as a part of an interview process, but like initial discussions, they were all through connections that I had built up in China or coming out of the school. So I think that is also one thing that is great to leverage is this, the school network and you know the people that you meet, because at the end of it they can also connect you with other um, organizations uh, or you know opportunities. Now one thing that I do receive now as a you know as a talent or an HR person are applications on LinkedIn. So you know there are a lot of um, direct messages that come across. So in addition to what Margarita said, I would also say that if you are really interested in a job opportunity or you find something that works for you, actually do send in a personal message. And I like that because a lot of times the messages that come in, they at, they at least attract your attention, you get noticed. And in certain moments, you know, I have been able to forward their application to the suitable department or at least connect them. So it's a good process for getting your foot into the door. Uh, rather than you know if you apply of course you know there might be a reply they might not be but at least then there's a possible you increase your probability by a few percentage points i would say great thank you sushant so uh we've got linkedin we've got leveraging your network in in, in shanghai uh neil anything to, to to add to that picture in terms of i guess kind of you know beginning the first steps of your search from uh from from shanghai or from china right yeah, I mean, so I'm probably going to verge more towards what Margarita was saying. So my main strategy was basically to apply for a hundred jobs a week on uh, just through LinkedIn. You know, and the simple reason being that it, it's just a numbers game. So I think in, during my full-time job search, I applied for like 1,500 jobs, had about 15 first-round interviews, five final-round interviews, and three offers, all in London. Um, so basically, that meant that just to, to get one first-round interview, I needed to apply for a hundred jobs on average or in other words, there was a 1% conversion rate. Now, obviously, before I scare anyone off here, this was during COVID. You know, I couldn't travel anywhere. Countries weren't really issuing visas and hiring budgets weren't unclear. So, you know, I'm certain the conversion rate nowadays would be a little bit higher. Um, my role itself was, um, was posted on LinkedIn. Um, I had a Zoom interview with my manager while in Shanghai, flew back to the UK for visa reasons. The day before my second interview, which I do not recommend because I was incredibly jet lagged, and then did the rounds of, in of intro calls with the executive directors and managing directors, and then got the job offer. Um, so usually my advice would be to just play the numbers game on LinkedIn. 
and just apply for lots of jobs. However, uh, LinkedIn's banned in China now. So I'm not sure what the localized version, I'm not sure how that works with applying for jobs overseas. Um, so to the extent you can still apply for lots of jobs overseas, yeah, continue doing that. But also I'd have two other recommendations that COVID made very difficult for me to do. So first is, you know, as, as I said, reach out to people at companies you're interested in and to alumni and the location and the industry that you're interested in. You know, hiring budgets now are much clearer um, and mid-level management seem to be very happy just to speak to anyone that have got an interesting background. And the second is to be uh, tactical when choosing your exchange school. So, for example, let's just say after your first year, you've decided you want to work in Singapore. If your exchange school is an M7 in the US, it's not really going to help you get an interview with firms in Singapore. So choosing, for example, NUS might be a better option for you just because you, know, you can meet with people, you can have coffee with them, you can interview with companies and you can learn more about the market. Thank you, thank you, Neil. And, and probably just to you know, mention about your point, the, the new LinkedIn here is, uh, is terrible, um, but uh, uh, I think that uh, we all have our own ways of accessing uh, good old uh, good old LinkedIn that I won't uh, go into any further details on this uh, on this call. Uh, cool. Um, I'm just going to do kind of one final, you know, very much quick fire questions, if, if that's OK, guys. And as I say, kind of this, you know, this is uh, this is really a kind of content webinar for the for the prospects today. Uh, I, I do work in admission, so I would, would be remiss if I didn't ask this question. But, um, you know, you're all kind of graduates from Sieves. Uh, you know, not everybody's so familiar with the MBA. I think maybe some people in the audience will be, some some won't be. But in, in your eyes, kind of in, from your kind of perspective, who is the MBA program for? And maybe just kind of give us, you know, one way it helped you in your in your career. Uh, maybe we'll start with Sushant. Sure. Um, I think from my perspective, the, the program is valid for anyone who wants to get a bit more in-depth understanding of China works. So, you know, you always have people who come for short business trips, they presume that they understand, you know, how the industry works, how the culture works. So I would say if you actually want to be someone who has a certain amount of grasp that you can add to your own experience, you can take that to a global level, I would definitely recommend the program. For me personally, I think it's, it's been a huge um, step forward in my career. So I was doing management consulting before um, uh, coming to the program and I was focused in HR and talent. And I wanted to use the MBA to pivot. And I wanted to get that first-hand experience in, 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 in house HR in China. And I don't think I could have done that without um, actually coming to the program because to be able to access the opportunities, you know, build that network, it's, it's very difficult. And to be able to show that you actually have an understanding of the market. And now the global role also, I think I sort of um, give a part of the credit to China or to the program itself, because beyond that, um, I don't think I would have had the opportunity to work with the organization that I did in China and then sort of, you know, come out uh, getting a more of a global position. So, yeah. Uh, thank you, Sushant. Uh, just while we're finishing these questions off, everybody, uh, if you do have any questions for the panel, then you can start writing them in the Q&A box, and that should uh, you know, manage, make us uh, have a bit more time to, uh, to go through as many questions as possible uh, after, we, after we finish. Uh, Margarita, maybe I come to, come to you next, please. Right. Well, in my case, I was already in China when I started my MBA. So, uh, my personal need was that of understanding the business dynamics in China together with the business dynamics outside, elsewhere in the world. Sibs was just perfect because Sibs was really what I was looking for. Um, in my previous job experience, uh, I was like working in China. I was often uh, um, joining some um, events uh, of, uh, for example, Italian institutions in China, the Italian embassy, the Italian chamber of commerce, uh, and our company, which was uh, uh, basically um, a, a Chinese company. I was working for the distributor of our ceramic tiles at that time. I was never able, let's say, to understand somehow how business dynamics would work. I was unable to take uh, and make uh, decisions. I had no responsibility. Uh, somehow I didn't understand sometimes why the Chinese boss would take some decisions and why the Italian boss would take some other decisions. Uh, 
But uh, after doing SIBS, I gained a lot of self-confidence. I got to know myself better because SIBS is not just a, a business school. It's a business school that uh, uh, probably makes you better aware of who you are and who you want to become. One of the most precious uh, learnings that I got from my MBA was probably this, because I had a lot of time to uh, challenge myself and put myself uh, in, uh, in some very, um, let's say, unexpected, uh, um, how to say, challenges. I mean, uh, you have a lot of uh, teamwork to do when you are in SEEPS. So uh, uh, I have to say, I was used to working in teams, uh, but it had never uh, felt like a real team work. But when you are in seeds and you have to work with your team in order to get a good result, a good uh, final uh, score in your exam, then you understand that no matter how much you agree or disagree with your teammates, uh, but you have to work together in order to reach that final goal, which is a good score in your in your final exam. So um, you learn a lot. You learn a lot. And uh, thanks also to uh, the classes of, uh, um, for example, organizational behavior that you take in SIEPS, uh, you have the chance to really get to uh, get to know yourself better and reflect on what you want to do, who you want to become, uh, where you want to focus on. Thank you, Margarita. And, and finally to you, Neil. So um, I suppose having gone through the whole MBA application process and with the benefit of hindsight, you know, I look at it like this. You know, when you choose in a business school, you need to have a specific goal in mind. So for example, if you know exactly which city or country you want to work in, you should go to a school there. So for example, if you want to work in Barcelona or Spain, go to ISA. But most people start an MBA and are pretty open as to where they want to be after graduation. So next, if you have a specific industry in mind, choose a school that is very that has a great reputation in, in that industry. For example, if you want to work in finance, go to Chicago Booth or go to LBS. But again, most people are pretty open in terms of what industry they want to work in. And they're more interested in perhaps like exploring different opportunities and different um, general management programs. So in that sense, you should probably choose a school that just boosts your USP, you know, the thing that makes you stand out from the crowd. And from my perspective, I wanted to round up my China knowledge base. And I thought SEEBS was a good way to do that, just to end my China journey. But uh, you know, from the other hand, I could have decided to apply to a U.S. school and you know, said that you know, I'm a European who's worked in China and studies in the U.S., so I've got a truly global perspective and I can bring that to a company. So in that sense, you know, it's all about how you want to frame yourself when you're applying for jobs and when you're talking to recruiters. And you know, I think SEEBS is useful if you want to add value to an existing USP, uh, but not really for people who want to make SEEBS a core part of the USP. And you know, just in terms of career progression, you know, I achieved everything I wanted during the MBA and I got the job that I wanted. So if you think about it pragmatically, if you couldn't have made that transition from pre-MBA to post-MBA life without the MBA, then it's obviously had a positive impact on your career development. Uh, thank you, Neil, and, and thank you for the uh, panelists uh, for answering my questions this evening. Uh, so I, I think we've run a little bit over time, but let's see uh, let's see how many we can we can get through. So again, if you have any questions, please pop them into the into the Q and A box uh, so we can go through them uh, one by one. Uh, we've got a, a couple in; uh, they're quite uh, Sieb specific. Um, uh, so from anonymous attendee, uh, how has Sieb's MBA helped? abroad outside of China when you have competitor university graduates in the market of Europe it's, uh, itself. Um, so I don't know if any of uh, our panel want to want to kind of have a, a go at that. I mean, obviously from the admissions uh, side, um, we have what the kind of uh, Neil and the panelists have, have already shared, you know, maybe about the exchange programs. Um, I think the the other obviously opportunity uh, is through the alumni chapters and and, and Margarita, you you had the uh, you're in the, the the management committee for the the Italian uh, chapter. Is is that right? Maybe you can kind of share a little bit, you know, what 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 that does, and also you know how potentially you would help or how it could help somebody kind of relocating uh, from China back to back to Italy. Of course, uh, the alumni chapter in Italy was created uh, um, during the pandemic. Basically, it's the newest uh, European alumni chapter existing. So. Um, I, I was 
basically contacting uh, uh, all the Italians uh, uh, that uh, uh, have been uh, doing an MBA program or an executive MBA or even an exchange in SEEPS. And um, now we are more than 50 people, 50 alumni uh, in this group. Uh, we've built uh, different communication channels. Uh, so we are basically, um, we are using a which, uh, WhatsApp uh, chat, and then we have a LinkedIn group, and then we have a WeChat as well, because some people are located in China. So uh, sometimes it's easier for uh, those located in China to meet up offline, while in Italy or Europe it could be more dif difficult because we are uh, sparse. Uh, um, some of us are in Italy, some others are in other countries in Europe, so it would be a little bit more difficult. But anyway, what we are doing uh, is... Um, now trying to uh, keep the community life uh, lively uh, with uh, some webinars. So a lot of online web events, uh, we organize webinars. We try to invite uh, um, business people um, from our own network and uh, uh, then involve the faculty from SEEPS so that uh, we could have uh, like a one hour uh, sharing, for example, about uh, different topics and uh, business topics uh, uh, and the like uh, from a business perspective and uh, an academic perspective. And now we are also organizing a workshop but together with SIPS in Zurich uh, that will take place in May, for example, in Italy. And that would be also the occasion to probably get to know uh, SIPS a little bit more. So I actually uh, extend the invitation uh, to uh, the audience today. If any of you is based in Italy and would like to uh, get uh, get a touch of what it's like to uh, attend a SIBS uh, a class uh, and teaching uh, that will be in May. So uh, you can probably contact me also on LinkedIn and um, get more information about the workshop that we're organizing in Milan in May. So um, yeah, definitely could be a point of uh, reference for uh, people based in Italy or close to Italy. And I would like to get more insights uh, about SIPS. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Margarita. So, so I guess maybe just to, yeah, just to, to, to summarize, you know, if you're, if you're maybe looking for opportunities in, in you know, in, in Europe and you're thinking of either SIEBS or, or a European school, then yes, the, you know, the majority of our resources are going to be, uh, you know, China, China centric. Um, but, you know, if we look, if we look beyond that, I think we have um, uh, now international uh, alumni, uh, I'd say that um, three quarters of our international alumni are based outside of China, you know, for maybe the similar reasons to Sushant and Neil was saying, right, it gets to a point that, you know, typically for, for internationals, you know, they, they are looking to kind of to, to maybe move on to more of a, a global role. And so they, they leave the, the country. So there is that wealth of support. Um, you know, during the program, you have things like the, the exchange program as well, international business plan competitions, etc, that kind of put you into a, the global picture, you know, and I think even Neil, when when you were obviously president of the finance club, you kind of connected the finance club with other kind of top schools from around the world, which uh, obviously encourages sharing for the uh, for the for the students. Um, maybe we'll kind of come back to that one in a bit, but maybe just to go through some of the the others. Um, this might not be the sweet spot for our panelists, but any suggestions on you know an MBA for people from an engineering background? Um, Sushant, you mentioned maybe there were R and D people at your company. I I feel maybe that's the the closest fit, or, uh, or you know, or maybe Margarita. I, I mean, I would say it depends not so much on your background, but what you want to do after the MBA. So you select a school based on that as what Neil said, right? If you're looking to specialize in finance, then you select a school accordingly. Um, I mean, if you're looking to still stay in engineering after going to a business school, then I would also question as to, you know, why would you want to go to a business school? But my first guess there would be maybe you can look at MIT. Uh, if that's that's helpful but other than that i think if you're looking to move to a general management track or move to you know something related to that in china then yeah of course it still makes sense i, I just maybe to, to to add to that that um you know i've been i've been at school now for, for coming up to, to seven years and each year we do have a healthy number of students that come from an engineering background. And I think for engineers that are looking to transfer to, to management, then definitely it makes sense. They tend to be, first of all, very good in the class, you know, on the, the verbal side, but also on the, you know, on the, on the quant side. Um, they tend to, you know, do, do very good, uh, do jobs kind of after the, after the MBA. Um, there's a, a Spanish guy, Eduardo, who graduated, I think in 2010. 
Uh, he came into the school with an en straight engineering background. Um, he did the MBA and then he landed at uh, Haiyar in, uh, in Qingdao, then moved to Xiaomi in Beijing. Uh, now he's with uh, he's with Alipay in uh, in Hangzhou. But the reason he joined um, Alipay in Hangzhou is uh, for, to get him ready to to kind of move to the to, to the European market, right? Um, I, I always remember one thing that you know he said to me that. The difference is obviously of kind of being a foreigner and doing the MBA here. He's actually involved in much kind of uh, higher level discussions, kind of above his pay grade, right? Because you know, as as we kind of talked about to tonight, it's a little bit of an echo chamber. But the the China experience for foreigners, you know, by and large, it is still very you know fairly unique and uh, you know thing to have um, on your on your on your resume. Um, Right. Uh, next one. How many years work experience is a reasonable amount of time before one should start applying for an MBA? Um, so I feel this is this is more admissions question. But um, if, if anybody from the panel wants to, to chip in. Uh, so typically for, for us, the minimum years of work experience is two years. Um, the maximum we take is maybe uh, you know 11, 12, um, but it's very much based on the on the individual, right? And as Sushant was was saying, right, it has to kind of come down to what's you know what's right for you. And you know we've seen some very mature kind of people with two years work experience applying. Uh, I won't share, but we've also seen some very immature people with 12 years work experience applying, right? So it really is about kind of getting a group that's kind of at a similar level going through the, the program. Um, but it has to be right for, you know, for you to, to start. Um, maybe this is a good jump off point because I've also kind of moved the slides in the background for those eagle eyed in the audience. Um, this is a QR code to, to, you know, to join a WeChat group from the from this event, uh, if you if you wish to. Um, I think that coming back to one thing that Sushant said was, you know, about leveraging your community, expat community in, in China. And this is very important. So as a school, you know, this is very easy for us to do because we have a, a strong alumni base that are, that, that are here. Um, but I know that that's not the same for everybody. So I hope, you know, in this WeChat group, you know, we can continue to share best practice uh, and information with each other or opportunities for people that are grappling with this very large issue of, you know, should I should I leave China or carry on on my career here? And for those that are interested in the, the MBA, um, I'll share a few more details, including one camp that we have upcoming in uh, in May. It's called the Beyond Borders Camp, um, and it's really a weekend that you can come to Sieves May 7th, May 8th. And live as an MBA student to really get a feel for what it's like. So you will join three lectures um, from faculty that I know our panelists will know quite well. Uh, Shamin Prashantham. Um, we also have Hyunyun Park and Professor Byron Lee. Uh, so we'll give you kind of a broad sense of a different marketing uh, strategy and OB related courses. Uh, and then we'll also bring our alumni network in as well. So last time we did it, we had about 20 alumni that are senior executives working in, in Shanghai. Um, and you kind of get to hear from them what it's all about and, and really get a good feel for the school. So I'll share that detail in the group. But again, if you use this WeChat group, if you have any questions or suggestions going, going forwards from, uh, from, from here. Um, I think that's all the questions that I have in. Uh, maybe we'll give it a little bit of time in case anybody has any other questions. But just while we wait to see if anybody's got any more, um, maybe I, I, I don't know if our panelists, if you have any kind of, you know, final parting thoughts or, or words of advice, you know, for the for the audience, you know, people that are maybe grappling with this decision of should I stay or should I go or, you know, in terms of kind of the next steps for the career. It's a very broad question because we have a very broad set of industries and functions in the audience tonight. But, you know, anything that maybe you'd have done differently or, you know, or any kind of pearls of wisdom that you you'd be remiss if you if you didn't share uh, this evening. Um, so maybe I'm going to call call Neil first because I kind of saw him slightly nodding and uh, yeah, we'll go to the others afterwards. Yeah, sure. Um, I suppose the only, the only thing, I, the only closing thought I would give is just, you know, whether it's alumni or current students, everyone's pretty open to speaking to, to new candidates or prospective candidates. So yeah, feel free to reach out to people, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, and, you know, I can either, I'm happy to have a chat with you or if I can put you in contact with someone who's more relevant to your experience, then yeah, I can do that. Uh, thank you, Neil. Uh, Margarita. Yeah, um, coming back to what you were saying, I mean, there was a question about how many years of experience, work experience you should have before applying for an MBA. Um, I would say that uh, it would be good to have a few years experience, a work experience behind, because uh, in the end, the MBA, for me at least, uh, meant to better understand something that uh, 
I was living, but I didn't understand. So it's like seeing the work you've done from an outer uh, perspective. In some cases, so you will attend uh, some courses. I remember, for example, business ethics, uh, the class of business ethics. And we were asked to uh, prepare, let's say, a yeah, reflection on a particular situation in your work experience in which uh, you have come into like difficulties, uh, maybe with your boss or with some colleagues because of some ethical issues. Well, in that case, if I did not have my um, previous job experience, I would, wouldn't have had so many probably things to, to say work related. So this is also why it is important to have some work experience. MBA is not just the prosecution of your uh, master degree. It's something else. I have uh, gone back to school after more than 10 years, right, uh, of uh, leaving my, my, my books. And it actually took me a while in order to refresh a little bit my mind and, and, uh, and get back the rhythm and the pace of, of studying. This is also a good uh, training for your mind. So I would suggest to, yes, have some work experience behind and then start the MBA. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, so, Shan, a, a question um, kind of came through to me personally. I don't know why it didn't go through to, to, to everybody. Um, so if you wouldn't mind answering this question first and then sharing your final thoughts. Um, as you say, kind of you were already working at BI when you made the transition to, to Germany. You know, I just wonder from what you've seen kind of on a global scale, any advice for maybe people in the audience tonight that that maybe don't want to go back to their their home countries like uh, Anil to the UK or Margarita to Italy? Uh, obviously, you're from uh, you're from India and then you came to China and then you went to Germany. So, you know, even any advice of kind of making that transition to a third country or even kind of, you know, I guess, for, you know, assimilating and kind of getting used to, you know, working in a, in a new country or all over again. Um, I mean, I think you you need to know yourself and you need to know what you're getting into. When I moved to China for seeds, I had actually never been to China before that. So it was it was a big decision to you know pack up everything and move to, to Shanghai, having never visited before. But I was like, you know, this is the experience that I want. So I'll do that. Uh, when coming to Germany, I had, of course, you know, been to Germany many times, but I've never lived here. So again, you know, these are challenges. I'm facing very similar challenges, settling in issues as I did when I was in China, but then that's a part of, you know, what I signed up for. I think moving to a country where you're not from, of course, is challenging. Language tends to become an issue. A lot of the times that I had discussions when we were graduating from seeds to look for jobs outside, um, language was a primary requirement. And that's where I think um, competitors or, you know, other students who are graduating from European schools or have an advantage of you know, having been born and brought up here and speaking the language has some advantage over you as a non-language speaking candidate. But I think after a few years, it's not so much in terms of where you've graduated from or where you come from, it's more about the experience that you bring to the table. And as long as you can sell that experience and you're very sure of what you want to get out of it from your next role, I think that discussion then flows uh, much smoothly. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up there, everybody. Um, I really appreciate your, your time and for joining us on a, on a Sunday morning, afternoon or evening, depending on, on where you are. Um, thank you very much to our, our panelists. I always enjoy uh, my time with them. Um, sadly, it's not in, in Shanghai anymore, but hopefully when uh, uh, COVID is behind us, uh, we'll, we'll we meet again. Um, but good to see you all. Uh, stay safe, everybody out there. And as I said before, please feel free to scan the WeChat code. I'm uh, happy to answer any any questions in the in the group and tell me a bit more about SEEBS and our Beyond Borders uh, camp that's coming up. Uh, I wish you all a good week ahead and, and thank you. Uh, all the best. Take care. Bye bye.